Hello? Okay. Oh, great. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for making the time to join us at uh, today's event on unlocking finance to accelerate the energy transition. Um, so this uh, event is put together by GFANS in collaboration with um, AIIB. Uh, thank you so much for the support of AIIB, both on our advisory board as well as um, for today's event. Um, we have a few components uh, that we'll touch on today. I think we'll start off with the opening remarks first by Sir Danny Alexander from AIB, after which we'll have a keynote address by Dr. Majin. Thank you so much for coming. And then we'll jump right into a panel discussion with five esteemed um, panelists, as well as uh, moderated by uh, Dale Hart Castle, who's our, our partner from Bain & Company. So without further ado, maybe allow me to invite uh, Sir Danny up for opening remarks. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm actually sick of bending down very low for this microphone, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use this one if it, if it, uh, if it works. Um, look, I, I'm Danny Alexander, Vice President of AIIB, and we're really delighted to host this uh, event. Uh, we have a very close partnership with, with GFANS. Where we're a member of the Asia uh, Advisory Council, um, and that comes from uh, our commitments on climate, we aim not only that at least half of our investments, uh, half of our finances should be climate finance um, by 2025, a goal we actually already achieved last year. Um, we also aim for a substantial part of our resources, 50% uh, by 2030 at least, for non-sovereign projects. And the, the, one of the goals of our corporate strategy is about private capital mobilization. And you know, it is, it is one of the um, key focuses of this COP, that we don't just have to scale up our public resources, we have to use those resources better to scale up private sector investment in climate transition. We're way behind on both fronts. Um, and so unlocking finance to accelerate the energy transition is absolutely the key topic for this immediate next phase. If we, if we don't succeed in unlocking finance to en accelerate the energy transition, then we will not succeed in taking the steps necessary to keep global temperature rises around 1.5 degrees as, 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 as committed to in the, in, the, in, the, in the Paris Agreement. So nothing could be more important. Um, I'm also, the second reason we're delighted to host this is because of our, our good friend and, and colleague, Dr. Ma Jun, who, uh, who is here with us today. And um, we, we earlier uh, today had the event for uh, uh, CASI, the C Capacity Building Alliance for, for Sustainable Investment. Um, and, and we've also joined um, or, or, or taken part in the uh, launch on, under GFANS of the Global Capacity Building Coalition. And so the, the focus on capacity building is, is, is a, a, there for a very good reason, which is very connected to, uh, to, this, to, this, to this topic. Um, if we don't build capacity among infrastructure investors and in client countries to develop more high quality projects, then there won't be anything to invest in. And if we don't build the capacity in financial institutions to, 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 to plan for the transition and to build their own transition plans, then the, the kind of key engine at the country level for delivering the, uh, uh, the, the energy transition will not be there. And so um, I think that the, the, the work that, 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 that GFANS is doing to um, support I'm going to uh, speak up even louder now to try and compete with the uh, wave of enthusiasm from next door. I hope that can be matched in this room. Um, uh, uh, if, we, if, we, if we don't succeed in getting the whole financial system committed to the transition, then we will not be so uh, effective. So look, we're here with our partners. We're delighted to welcome you to the AIB Pavilion. That's really all I have to say because the people who know what they're talking about are to follow. Um, so I would hand, us, hand it back to the, to the moderator uh, and look forward very much to listening to what's said. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Danny. Now may I invite Dr. Majin, President of the Beijing Institute for Finance and Sustainability, to deliver the keynote address. Uh, Dr. Majin, please. Yeah. I'd like to use this uh, mic as well. Uh, we have suffered from uh, bending ourselves <laughs> for uh, the last session. So, well, thank you very much uh, uh, for inviting me to join this uh, um, transition finance discussion. And uh, um, as uh, Danny said, uh, uh, capacity being as a major part of this uh, transition. Um, but I'd like to outline a sort of a bigger framework, which is a G20 transition finance framework. Uh, that was a piece of work which I spent uh, 
almost the last entire year uh, working on as a co-chair of the G20 uh, System of Finance Working Group. Now, this framework has outlined uh, five key elements, which I think very important for countries, for institutions, and uh, uh, for the ecosystem. Um, you know, including our capacity building uh, platforms to uh, to work on. The first uh, key element of the transition finance framework is uh, the uh, definition of transition activities. We have to really uh, make sure they are defined clearly. Otherwise, we'll end up with a lot of transition washing. You know, a lot of uh, companies will claim that we're doing transition, but in fact, these are not credible transition activities. The two approaches to define and label transition activities. One is uh, in the case of China, we uh, is moving towards a taxonomy, which is called transition taxonomy. This is being developed by the central bank, and uh, currently they have drafts for four sectors transition activity, including coal fire power generation, steel, cement, and agriculture. In fact, we just heard yesterday, Singapore had came up with a transition taxonomy, um, which is a part of the sort of uh, broader taxonomy. So these are the approach which uh, some countries are taking. And uh, of course, uh, Japan and the US may be going for what we call uh, principle-based uh, um, approach to define and label transition activities. But in any case, we need to have some methodologies. And the second key pillar for transition finance is disclosure. And uh, disclosure of transition activity is much more complex than the disclosure of a pure green activity, which we use to finance with green bonds and green loans. A pure green activity would refer to maybe a solar project, a wind project, and uh, the disclosure of these activities is what I call a snapshot, a photo. But the uh, disclosure of transition activity is like a movie. We have to make sure that uh, they will tell us what they do in the coming 30 years from the current high level um, carbon emission towards net zero. So what is the short-term target? What is the long-term target? What is the medium-term target? Why it's credible and uh, why it's sign-based? So that's really the planning, right, of net zero. And uh, that part is a key component of a, a disclosure. The third pillar of a transition framework is a range of financial products, uh, including loans and bonds and equities and insurance and others. And uh, a key feature of these products is to link the performance of decarbonization with the financial terms. For example, in the form of loans and bonds, the interest rates will be linked to how much you decarbonize, right? If you're decarbonizing more quickly, I will give you a lower funding cost. And uh, the fourth pillar is uh, the uh, policy incentives, which will make some of the transition activities more bankable. Uh, I would say most of the green activities are now bankable already, at least in the case of China. We see the solar, wind, battery, electric vehicle cars actually making money, and they don't need much of government subsidies. But uh, the guys in steel, cement, petrochemical, they're in very difficult situation, and they're very hard to find low-cost funding sources, and therefore we need to improve their probability, at least outlook, forecast of the future return, and thereby they can attract more you know, funding and low-cost funding. And in this regard, we are calling for the governments, including the fiscal authorities, monetary authorities, local governments with other resources, including land and so on, to provide these resources and making the bank uh, projects more bankable. The final component of transition finance framework is what we call just transition. And by just transition, you know, different countries have different sort of understanding of the meaning, but the one common component, that's employment. Every country says in the G20 that we have to make sure the transition process will not yield huge unemployment. And uh, it's not just a job for the government. Of course, in some countries with stronger fiscal capacity, uh, they can provide social security safety net. But in many developing countries, the government is not equipped with the resources. Therefore, the financial sector and the corporates have to be part of this uh, solution to just transition. So within G20, we're calling the financial institutions to work with the company to develop a transition plan that assess the implication on employment. Basically, if I'm a lender, I will ask the company, say, you want to transition, but tell me how much you're going to lay off people in the transition process. If you're laying off a lot of people, tell me, do you have a plan to mitigate these impacts, including by working on a, uh, for example, retraining, reskilling program, which is part of a capacity building as well so that it will enable these people to find jobs in other places. 
So all of these, I think, need to be integral part of the transition finance framework and need to be implemented at the country level, institutional level. Just a report in China, there are two um, green finance pilot regions, including Huzhou and Chongqing. They have already come up with their transition taxonomy. Huzhou has a 106 items of transition activities in the table, and Chongqing has 120 items uh, listing the transition activities. And Huzhou has put out incentives, which is a government subsidy for interest payments for 60 transition projects. So all of these are ongoing already, and I think it will feed into um, the uh, global landscape of uh, mobilizing financing for transition activities. So with that, uh, let me hand it back to the uh, moderator, and thank you very much again for inviting me to join. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Majin. So well, next, we'll move on to the panel discussion. And maybe before I invite the moderator up, let me uh, touch on a few key themes uh, that would be useful for us to discuss as part of a panel. So as Dr. Majin mentioned, I think there are many different facets to you know, uh, the, the energy transition itself. Of course, as we look at the different reports that IEA has, has recently you know, published on the World Energy Outlook, as well as the Electricity Grids uh, kind of reports, and of course, the GFANS uh, APEC Network's report on financing the managed phase out of coal-fired power plants. Clearly, that this is part of a whole you know, ecosystem effort, and we require different parts of the energy transition. And I think in addition to this, finance itself plays an important role. As we know, the trillions of dollars that's required every year on this energy transition. So I think, uh, allow me to now let the experts actually speak to this topic, and maybe I'll pass the time over to moderator Dale Castle. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> um, so, so I thought a great job from our two sort of you know opening speakers to kind of set the stage and, and speak over the noise. Uh, of course, this is a, a complex issue that uh, we often need to sort of cut through the noise. Um, but I think you know, despite uh, you know the noise, uh, there is a great deal of uncertainty to, around the pathway forward and how we can sort of collectively respond to the challenges at hand and sort of other things. Uh, but despite that sort of uncertainty, I think there are really sort of three things that are certain as we sort of approach the discussion and the topic. You know, one, that, that there's definitely sort of an overarching sort of sense that we're not moving fast enough. Uh, I think second, it, it's certain that there's clearly not enough cash today to get done what needs to get done. Uh, and third, you know, we need to find some way to kind of close this gap to, to pre prevent and mitigate the kind of climate action that, that's going to sort of happen. Um, so I think, you know, with that, we're, we're very fortunate to have, uh, I think, a distinguished and diverse panel today, uh, you know, to sort of guide the set of discussion, and, and, and maybe I'll ask the panelists to come up and introduce them, you know, one by one. So first, um, maybe sort of mirror the, yeah. so, so, so first up here uh, is, is, of course, uh, you know, Justin Wu. Justin is the, the APAC co-head of kind of climate change with HSBC. Then to Yuki Asui, who is the, the managing director for, for GPAN fans in sort of Asia Pacific. Uh, Abhishek Podar, the India country head with Macquarie Group. Cheng Lin, the, to, the director of the Center for Collaboration with the, the Beijing Institute for Finance and Sustainability. And last but not least, on, on the far kind of left, is uh, Dr. Christoph McBade, who leads the energy supply unit with the IEA. So let me speak a little bit closer to the mic. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, a great group, and we'd like to really, I think, dive into some of the issues that we sort of see around what will it take to, to scale sort of transition finance to address the pretty material challenge that Asia and the wider world faces around the, 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 the transition. So I thought to, to start it off would be good to talk a little bit about some of the building blocks to sort of set the stage. Um, the IA, of course, has, has been and continues to be sort of instrumental, as it has been through its history, in kind of looking over the horizon and trying to sort of understand how is the fuel mix and sort of other things sort of, you know, coming together and, and where are we sort of going, how do we see different sort of scenarios and the like. So if I could ask Dr. Christoph, maybe, first of all, to, to share a few of the insights as we think about the building blocks from, of course, many of the recent sort of studies that they've done with the most recent energy outlook and other work on the transition and the like. Doctor? Do we have more than one mic or just one mic? Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Thanks. Thanks very much, Dale. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here, and thank you to our, our hosts at the AIIB for giving the opportunity to the IEA to, uh, to speak on these very, very important topics. 
I only have give, been given a few minutes, so it's very difficult to cover the whole range of all, everything that's required if we are to really get on track with, with our, the shared goals of limiting the temperature rise to 1.5 degrees. But we have set out what I would say four plus one key pillars that we need to see by 2030 if we're serious to get about getting on track, uh, getting on track to net zero by 2050. First of all, we need to triple renewables. This is luckily one of the things that there's been a lot of focus on at the conference, and we've seen a number of countries signing up to that. One aspect which I think is increasing in attention, but still doesn't ha yet have the attention that's required, is on what's required to underpin that tripling in renewables. And very importantly, part of this is investment into grids. We look at the, the, the pipeline of projects that exist today for renewables. There's about 1,500 gigawatts of renewables that is ready to go. It's either sitting there, it's already com completed, or it's at advanced stages, and it's waiting for grid connections. Unless we invest in grids, we're not going to get that renewable deployment coming through. We need to see, roughly speaking, a doubling in our investment from what we've had in recent years to get that level of, of deployment of renewables. Second area is on efficiency. We need to double our rate of energy efficiency improvement. And here again, what's needed is money. There has been some progress, good progress, in parts of the world, in advanced economies in particular, where we see the biggest gap between recent investment levels and investment levels that we are required is in emerging market and developing economies. In some countries, in some parts of the world, it's about a factor of 30 difference, that we'd, a 30-fold increase required in investment into efficiency, particularly in buildings and in industry. The third area is on fossil fuels. If we have that doubling in efficiency, if we have that tripling in renewables, we will see a reduction in fossil fuel use. We have a, in our net zero scenario, our net zero by 2050 scenario, which is aligned with 1.5 degrees, we have a 25% reduction in fossil fuel demand over the period of 2030. And it's very important for producers to be incorporating that sort of idea into their investment plans. There was, I think um, a while ago, there was a, this idea that what we need to do is shift investment completely from fossil fuels into clean, and if we do that, that will be sufficient for what we require to get on track for 1.5 degrees. Unfortunately, that's not the case. As Dale mentioned, what we need to see is a huge increase in the overall amounts that are being spent. The, the, the orders of magnitude here are, are not the same. We do need a decrease in fossil fuel supply investment if we're to get on track for 1.5 degrees, but we need to see a significantly bigger increase into, uh, into the clean energy technologies. And the fourth area which is related to that is on, on methane. Um, Dr. Jun mentioned the importance of not greenwashing, not, not transition washing. One area where we see is very important, where we need more investment, is into methane emissions reductions. Absolutely, the oil and gas industry should be taking the primary responsibility for cutting down on methane emissions. Methane emissions are one of the largest causes of, of uh, climate change today, one of the cheapest ways that we can reduce greenhouse gas gas emissions around the world. But there are parts of the world where we probably won't see that investment happening from the oil and gas industry. If we look at some of the low-income countries, if we look at some of the areas where there's national oil companies, they won't be able to mobilize the finance that's required into methane emission reductions by themselves. We've identified about 15 to 20 billion dollars that will be challenging to mobilize in the area of methane emission reductions. And this is where it comes down to rules and public understanding that investment into methane emission, emission reductions is not investment into fossil fuels. If that's the perception for people, we won't see that investment coming through. So those are our four key pillars that we need to see. All of them are underpinned by a huge increase in investment and making sure that we can finance an investment in this timescale that's needed. Thank you. So Christoph, that was great and obviously a lot to unpack there as, as we get into the discussion with the panel. Um, but maybe bef before we do that, perhaps I think it's worthwhile to talk sort of one sort of, you know, further sort of question around sort of building blocks. Um, ultimately, of course, there are sort of sectoral, so sectoral uh, you know, building blocks that we need to sort of consider, but we're also sort of seeking to do more than just build these sectors and drive change at a more system level um, across kind of the region, across sort of industries and other things. Um, and, and Yuki, maybe this would be a good time for you to sort of come in and share some of the perspectives from, from GFANS, um, given, of course, you know, those types of system changes is, is exactly, you know, what the mandated mission is. Yeah, thank you. And um, thank you very much for AIB for hosting this session. Um, so, yeah, I think, as mentioned a couple of times, 
it is a whole systems change that we need to go through. And finance plays a key role in there. But there's a lot of other things that need to come together with finance. And um, Mark, in this COP, Mark Carney, my boss, has been mentioning three gaps that need to be met. One is the data gap. And um, we've made some progress by announcing the, the net zero data public utility at COP, um, where we are trying to bring together some of the data to make it more accessible to everyone. So that's scope one, two, three, uh, emissions for companies and financial institutions. Um, and then the, the next one, um, but it's also something that we need to keep going. So a lot more disclosure needs to happen everywhere in the world uh, to inform each other. The next one is um, the, the planning gap. So this is why we are actively promoting net zero transition plans, both for financial institutions and for, and for uh, companies as well, and also for countries as well. It would be really useful for all countries to come up with their energy transition plan um, that would inform the industries and financial institutions on how the country is thinking are going forward in their transition, how fast um, are things going to be changing, and where does the finance need to go? And then the last one um, is the investment gap. So yes, we do need a lot of investment, um, not only, like as Dr. Christoph said, about moving from uh, fossil fuel investment to green investment, but the acceleration of that as well. And there, I think, Private finance does play an important role, but as uh, Sir Danny was saying earlier, uh, we need to work together with public finance um, on blended financing uh, and to work together to make sure that we are crowding in um, private finance with uh, public finance. And um, there are other innovations that are required in sustainable finance, such as carbon credits, and um, so all these kind of things uh, still need to come together. Yeah. So a long list between the kind of, I think, these sort of changes as, as well as the, the other sort of, you know, sectoral things we talked about. Um, as always, you know, the, the battle to sort of drive change and, and kind of move the, the needle forward for the transition and to be able to finance it is, is both a, a regional as well as a local, you know, issue that, uh, that I think we're all sort of collectively working at uh, every day. Um, I, perhaps it would be, I, th I think, kind of worthwhile to, to get some sort of perspectives, both, I think, regionally as well as locally, from some of the, the panelists as we dive in. Um, and maybe, you know, Cheng, then perhaps you could kind of kick us off with a little bit of stuff, I think, perspective with some of the things you're sort of seeing in your day-to-day -day engagement as we look at, you know, where is the opportunity to, to really sort of move faster and do more? Um, but what are some of the, the challenges to sort of unlock that at the same time? Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Um, let me try to speak closer. I think I just uh, try to um, <clears throat> um, come in with uh, two points. Uh, one thing is the, from China's point of view, how transition finance has been approached by China. So um, we have been talking about the sectoral approach. In China, it's about the same thing. But we, in the meantime, we also see from national to subnational levels, as Dr. Ma pointed out in his um, keynote speeches. So in China, the green finance market has been developing more like a from top-down um, approach. But for transition finance, actually the challenge is part, the most challenging part is that um, the level of development from um, province to province actually are varying to the same, almost the same, let's say, state um, as to the difference between countries and countries in some part of China. For example, Eastern China, actually, they are developing um, much faster, but actually they also have the most efficient production lines and uh, the technologies and uh, maybe facilities. So the <coughs> transition, um, let's say, challenges they are facing will be different from other provinces. Let's say in Zhejiang province, which is leading, for example, Huzhou in Zhejiang province, is pretty much leading uh, in green financing. They have the highest ratio of green loans in terms of the uh, total loans. Um, and also in terms of transition, they are also leading. And uh, they are not actually um, constrained by, let's say, the largest barrier, um, or largest, largest sector of emission is the coal sector or the power sector in, in China. But in Zhejiang uh, or in Huzhou may not be the case. They do not have very much reliance on coal. So their um, most, let's say, challenging part is coming from the manufacturing, including some clothing, um, some metals, and maybe some petrochemicals. 
So that part would be quite different, significantly different from the overall China and also um, other parts of China or from other provinces, for example, Shanxi province, where coal will be a big problem for them. And this is the same case for other countries. And if we look into details into some companies and financial firms level, actually the, the puzzle is getting um, clear and clear on how and what shall be done. And uh, that's the first point about uh, what shall, um, the, the, the regional or the country uh, perspective. And the second thing is, I think since we're talking about transition finance, how the financial sector can be further mobilized to raise the funds or to support the decarbonization processes. And I was told of quite a few times, the funds are there in the market, we have hundreds of billions of dollars, and the needs is there. In China, I think we have as much as 480 some trillion RMB that is needed to realize our carbon neutrality goal by 2060. So in US dollars, it's almost like 100, uh, US, 100 trillion US dollars in the future. So that's a lot of funds, the funds are there, but how to move the funds over there, that's the largest challenge. Um, in between, I think, for example, the GFAS has been working on transition planning, which is good. And one way is to build a trust between the financiers and fundraisers. Well, for big ones, big companies, I think it's easier. They have credit rating, they have existing financing channels, but for SMEs, do you think they can live up to 2050, 2060? Um, maybe they do not even have uh, the trust in themselves of whether or not they can live up to 2050 or 60. So transition planning for them would be something quite challenging. Do we have to do the same way um, as a big company does? Probably not. Probably need to simplify for that. And also, do we have to raise the same requirement uh, for SMEs for, as for the big companies? Probably not. Um, actually, in the very early days of China, I think I always want to say this uh, more like an analogy. Um, so Deng Xiaoping was saying, we need to open up China's market. And uh, whoever, uh, it's more like a black, and, black cat and uh, white cat's theory. Whether, or not, whether you're black or white, actually, those cats who can uh, cats rights are good cats. So for SMEs, do we have to uh, differentiate the level of decarbonization or the contribution to decarbonization by um, the either carbon intensity terms or by absolute terms? Maybe something we can also consider to differentiate. And this is a problem especially faced not only in China, but in many other global South countries, especially in South Africa, uh, sorry, African countries. And just in the report launched yesterday, Transition, African Transition Finance Framework, which we have been working together with the MRSA uh, for our um, GIP's regional chapter in, in, in Africa. They uh, published the first report of a series in the future, focusing on investors, uh, most like uh, um, asset managers' uh, point of view. But in the future, I think there will be more discussion to this point. So a lot of you know common challenges there, but also some very specific ones as well, which which of course kind of differ from country to country. Um, Abhishek, of course, you know India has has been on the front line of a lot of the the build out that we've seen in renewables, the other sort of you know challenges around kind of energy and kind of the the, the sort of emerging middle class and booming economy. We would love to hear you know some of your perspectives, you know both from there and, and kind of some of the other markets you're touching on, maybe things that are sort of common as well as more unique. Yeah. No. Thanks for that and. Thanks, AIB, for having us over. I think from a, let me start with a slightly broader perspective from Macquarie, and I'll, I'll come into India as well. As within Macquarie, we see, uh, from an opportunity perspective, pretty much four different uh, ways. One is to rapidly scale up uh, the mature technologies, right? These are the wind and the solar, and there's already a lot of investment going, but that's not enough. So that needs to be, that needs to be continuously scaled up. Second is to commercialize new technologies, right? Electric vehicles, uh, hydrogen, uh, battery storage, and, and, and lots of other newer, newer uh, green technologies that's coming in. Third is sitting behind all of these is, is how do you enable better access and availability of uh, commodities and critical minerals? That is absolutely fundamental. And, and I will go a step further and say the infrastructure that is required, right? So from a power generation to the power source, the grid infrastructure, and all the enabling infrastructure that needs to be done. Uh, that's a big opportunity, and that's a big way to look at that, right? And I think the fourth, fourth opportunity, which is also one of the biggest challenges, and I'm so glad is, is a large focus of, uh, of COP28, is work with corporates to really drive hard to abate sectors, right? which, is, which contributes to 30, 40% of the carbon emission. And honestly, if you really look at this, where the, where the last trials have been done has been on power generation and light vehicles. I, you know, even, even heavy transportation vehicles are slow to move, leave aside you know, the steel and cement and likes of those kind of things. So that's how we've been, we've been approaching. And I think uh, driven by that, 
there are some very good success stories coming out from Macquarie. For example, our, uh, we have a portfolio company called Corio Generation, which is setting up 30 gigawatt of offshore, uh, offshore generation capacity globally, right? Including, including a bunch of them in, in Asia uh, as well. Uh, partnering with, uh, with IFC, two days back we announced a one and a half billion dollar green methanol project in Mexico. Uh, and that was primarily driven because Europe has not put in a very strong uh, requirements for, for uh, green shipping side of things, right? So as the investments are going in, you know, I think sometimes there is obviously an issue of investments still continue to flowing into the developed markets than on the developing markets. But what you need to understand is, yes, IRA is sucking out a lot of investment, but that's also driving a supply chain benefit, uh, benefit out of it. Scale does matter in bringing down the cost of, uh, cost, of, uh, uh, cost of doing all of these particular projects as well. And similarly, you know, I think you, you touched upon blended finance. And for us, that's an important way to look at the problem because the problem is huge, the need is huge. Neither the public financing nor the private financing is equipped to address it. Not necessarily from, a, from the availability of capital. I'm completely with you. Capital is there. It's different problems need to be addressed by different kinds of capital, right? And that's where public blended finance comes in. And we have a very live example where in India, we've launched a one and a half billion dollar electric vehicle electrification program in partnership with Green Climate Fund to primarily drive, address the hard, hard heavy transportation sector and drive electrification of those, right? So lots of opportunities, lots of, lots of ways to play into this need to move faster, you know, the, op the, the investments are still flowing into larger economies. 80, if I remember the numbers correctly, 80% of the investments in over the last 10 decades flew into developed economies. Just 10 countries. 10 countries, right? And exactly, right? So it's, it's still very, very concentrated, very focused, and hence, you know, over the last four days, at least the conversations I've been having all across is how do we drive large-scale impact but also don't create massive sort of laggards versus uh, people who are, who are going ahead with the same. No, no, absolutely. And I, I think that also, you know, speaks to, you know, the, the, the region, you know, many of us sort of operate in, which of course is Asia, right? And, and as we, you know, think about sort of Asia, uh, if we're not able to, to address the financing and the transition challenge, not just in so we, the, the more mature economies, but even the developing ones, uh, then we, you know, we will lose the ability to, to, to manage this, right? And I think particularly as we look at the next decade ahead, uh, you know, what happens in Asia is going to have a, a pretty pronounced impact on the wider world. Uh, you know, even though a lot of tension, and tension goes other places, uh, you know, our ability to move the needle there in terms of the energy transition, in terms of protecting nature and other things is critically important. Um, so given that Asia perspective, you know, Justin, we would love to hear from you and kind of HSBC's, you know, perspective, uh, you know, operating across most of the region and the countries and, and, and here, you know, how are you sort of thinking about the opportunity set and, you know, where are you sort of putting focus challenge-wise? Sure, yeah, Thank, thanks for having me here. Um, I, actually, I'm in a somewhat, I think, reflective mood right now because we, we spent sort of, yesterday was all finance day, today's energy day, you know, that this is sort of the, uh, I think, two very busy days for, for probably all of us on this panel. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I think there's, there's quite a bit to, to think about, right, about this topic. I mean, one is that I think the opportunity aspect is, is, it seems quite clear, and I think we, you know, I think we have some consensus about it, right? Whether it's, you know, the trillions of dollars, the amount of money that needs to be invested um, for the energy transition, um, which I, I keep saying to everybody that this is not sort of in addition to everything else you do. It, it, it is what you do, right? So there's, there's always this sense that, well, oh my goodness, where are we going to find, you know, $4 trillion or whatever number, or, you know, two, $4 trillion a year, whatever the number is at the moment. Um, but, you know, how much, get, how much does it get invested? You know, how much money do companies and governments and others actually invest in infrastructure and economic development, FDIs, et cetera, right? So I think that's one thing to think about. Um, the, the second point is that, of course, I think uh, both Christoph and Abhishek, you touched on is just sort of the maturity of technologies and the competitiveness of technologies. And I think, you know, uh, you know having been in the renewable energy industry for almost 20 years, I, I noticed that actually it's not a technology issue so much anymore in the sense that we have sort of scalable technologies already today, right? Wind and solar, certain extent, electrification of, of uh, passenger vehicles, two or three wheelers, is moving extremely quickly, even in, in some of these emerging markets. So it doesn't seem to be a technology issue uh, as well. 
And then I think that this distribution uh, issue, I think Abhishek, you touched on that, and, and several of you actually did, um, seems to be a very poignant one because, um, you know, we hear that actually uh, it, something like one, was it $1.8 trillion of energy transition investment was uh, this, I think this year, I can't remember now. Um, but where is it all going, right? It's, it's going to, well, developed markets. It's going to China. I think 40% is China. And then the, the, the remaining portion that actually goes to emerging markets and developed economies, is, I think, is only four countries, Brazil, India, um, and two others. I can't remember them, sorry. But, but I think you get my point, right? And then, but, but now, of course, you know, we at HSBC and, and along with GFANS and some of the other financial institutions, we, we're, we've been involved in the Just Energy Transition Partnerships, which look at Indonesia and Vietnam. Uh, we talk, uh, we participate in a number of pavilion events in some of the other ASEAN markets. We talked about uh, this region. We talked about Sub-Saharan Africa. The financing clearly, the d distribution is not going to those places, right? So there is something that's missing. Um, and then I think I was at the Cassie event earlier today, uh, which Dr. Ma, you know, uh, m my colleague Jenny McKinnis was, was here with you on stage, along with several other banks and, and others. Um, and then, you know, I think the comment was made about how there seems to be a willingness amongst financial institutions like HSBC and others to provide the finance and sort of, you know, supply. There is obviously uh, identified a need to do this, but there's, there's something that's missing, right? Where's the target? Where, where are the bankable projects? Where's the credibility of the transition plans that are, that are needed? Um, I might be going on a little bit too long, but essentially, you know, we, a lot of our partnership strategy and the things we do is trying to close that gap, right? Whether working with GFANS on phasing out of sort of high emitting assets, the coal phase out, the CASI uh, capacity building programs, you know, I'm hoping that these things will actually, you know, unlock something for us. Right. Clearly, I think there, there is some missing ingredient here that's, that's sort of not matching supply and demand. Um, it's almost like a market failure situation that we're dealing with. But, you know, if there's a will, I think there's a way to maybe find a solution here to sort of channel the amount of finance that clearly we want to deploy into technologies which are mature and scalable and are cheap into countries that actually really need them. Well, I think that's, that's a great point, and, and maybe let's, I'd like to sort of, you know, transition in a moment to talk a little bit about collaboration, but I think before we do that, I think let's, let's stay with this point about renewables, right? We've, 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 all of you in varying degrees have mentioned the need to, to scale them up, um, you know, whether it's sort of 3x or 4x, depending on, you know, where you look in the region, clearly a, a need for great material sort of, you know, growth, you know, within the sector. Uh, I think, you know, you've all sort of commented, and, and, and we see in our work with many sort of clients and sort of other reports that we do, that... There's, you know, no shortage of projects that are sort of in the pipeline that have been sort of proposed, and yet a continued refrain as well, there's no shortage of capital. Um, yet we, you know, continue to see sort of a logjam and in, in sort of roadblocks that are there in terms of the ability to, to finance and build out kind of the, the, the transmission and grid infrastructure to be able to do that as well as sort of other things. Um, so I'd love to put the panel on the spot and, and, and just ask maybe for some quick thoughts around... So what really needs to change? You know, like what are the first two sort of building blocks that we need to sort of somehow sort of address to, to be able to move this forward? I think, you know, in our own work, we've heard a few different things. I mean, Justin, you touched on investors really want to see more certainty in terms of transition plans from governments. I'm not sure really that's always the whole story. Personally, I feel there's still a lot of questions around who's going to pay and, you know, how does that sort of transition through? But I, I would love... To, to maybe hear your, your kind of thoughts, maybe one by one, kind of on this. And Justin, I'll let you continue. If, you, if there's anything you want to add to what you've already said, that, but then can hand over to Yuki. Yeah, I think, well, I think on transition plans, Dale, I, th I think it was more about, um, yes, I, I actually agree, governments, yes, I mean, obviously, but that's linked to the NDCs and, and obviously the, the policies that a country puts in place, right, to implement its NDC. Um, but also, I th I, what I was actually referring to was more the companies um, okay. themselves that have to deploy it. And I mean, we're, we're, I don't think now we're unique in taking this approach, even though we, we, you know, we, we've been trying to, um, well, I, I feel that we're very, ac HSBC, we're very active in, in this approach in the sense of evaluating or looking at transition plans or engaging our clients on their transition plans, right? And, and, then, and then sort of almost working backwards to sort of find the, uh, then what are the bankable, you know, what are the projects and what are, what are the sort of things that we need to, to finance uh, to sort of help the client achieve its, its transition plan. So that's sort of okay. the approach we've been taking on that, yeah. 
Why don't we jump down to Abhishek and mix it up a little bit? Yeah. It's a it's a very complex problem. Right? It's not. I wish it was that simple because. But, but I guess. Yeah. yeah. But my, my challenge to, to I think to not just you but all of us is like, you know, we've been talking about this for many years. Yeah. To, yeah. And, and sort of I think, you know, report after report, study after study, discussion after discussion, you know, comes back to the same issues. Um, to if you know if the projects are there and you sort of stack them up, uh, if the money is there, to, um, you, know, you know, how do we begin to sort of close the gap here in, in terms of maybe. A, a few tangible first steps we could sort yeah, of take so to, to at least even better understand the problem, even if we can't yeah, sort yeah. of solve it. So let me provide a book, some more nuances to this, right? Yeah. We, I wish life was so black and white yeah. for all of us. Majority, a large part of Global South is not investment grade. Yeah. Private capital just won't flow, mm. beat it, right? We can beat around the bush, mm. private capital would not flow. And it's not investment grade because the policy frameworks are not placed, the geopolitics is a terrible side, mm -hmm. the currency is in a, in a shitty situation. That's the real, real problem, mm -hmm. right? So projects, there may be a need in many of the Southeast Asian countries. Unfortunately, many of us just will not be able to invest. Mm -hmm. Second aspect, we can talk green hydrogen, we can talk all this thing. The fact is today's cost and tomorrow's cost will be more expensive than the conventional. Who pays for it? Commercial investor is not going to pay for it, right? Consumer is not going to pay for it. Mm -hmm. Who's going to pay for it? So are you asking public, if you ask public finances to pay for it, how many countries have the public finances to pay for it? A US can come with a trillion dollar IRA, sucks out the investment. Mm -hmm. Can India do it? No, yeah. despite the fourth largest economy. So that's where I'm, you know, so it, at a very macro level, you can say projects are there, money so is there. Fully agree with you, and that's exactly so I tell, where I tell I you. And hence, you hence, yeah. hence the problem, hence, yeah. the, hence the solution or, or, or aspect that we've been talking about. And that's why I'm personally mm. a big fan of, of the concept of blended finance. Mm. This is exactly at the core of the. While the, there is a different color to the capital that is coming in, there are different risks that public finances can underwrite. They bring, they underwrite the loss, the 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 the, the some of these issues on which commercial capital like us cannot underwrite, right? Whether it's is the, is the FX risk, is the, is the country risk, is the project viability risk. Mm. Blend that with the large quantum of private capital and the efficiency of the private capital. Yeah. That, in my mind, is a much smarter and, and smoother problem to solve than just trying to do a al capital allocation, yeah. I would say. Understood. Just, you can go ahead, yep. And blended finance is a, still a problem to solve because as you say, that's how public finance should be operating, but that's not how the, a lot of the <laughs> development banks are set up right now. Exactly. So that is definitely a, 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 a roadblock that, is, that everyone is trying to solve at the moment. Um, and World Bank and ADB and AIB are already saying that they want to solve this as well. But it is a big mindset change for them because that's not how they were um, they that's not how they are assessing their current success you know but we need I think growing I think we see a growing consensus that they need to be assessed in a different way yeah yeah, yeah. can I jump down to Chris, Dr. Christoph because I know he has to, to leave a wee bit early for another panel but please go ahead I, I mean, I, I fully agree with everything that's been said, and the excellent points have been raised. Um, I would, would perhaps have a slightly, just to add to the conversation rather than repeating what's already been said, one of the key things that we see from every, every stakeholder right now is a slight disbelief at how quickly things are currently moving. This, this applies to governments, it applies to private companies, it applies to financial actors. We put out... Um, about a month ago, our latest World Energy Outlook, which suggested that on the basis of current policies, demand for each of the fossil fuels is going to peak before the end of this decade. So oil will peak, gas will peak, coal will peak. Coal will peak soonest, oil and gas slightly later on. There was widespread disbelief that that, that really is how quickly things are, are, are moving and that people are still in this mindset, I mean, even from two or three years ago, that, oh no, clean energy can't possibly be moving that quickly. We can't be investing in, in those projects because they are, they're just, it's just not there. And so we need to see that change in attitude, I think, from, from governments, 
in particular. I mean, and I absolutely fully agree. Governments have to take the lead on this. The reason we're not on track for any of our climate targets is because governments haven't yet stepped up with the policies that are required. But it does require others to also make, take that leap. This, this attitude of we're just, we'll wait and see or we're just providing the energy that people currently want, that's no longer really an acceptable reaction to the challenges that we face. We need to see that change from everybody. So, Christoph, I haven't one th come to you in a second, Justin. So, I haven't had a chance to read the report in detail, but but uh, I have to sort of ask the question, right? To, to, I think we, you know, we all have great optimism on bending the curve and where we're going. Um, at the same time, you know, we look at the numbers from last year and we see that fossil fuel, you know, consumption globally is likely to be up. Um, how do we square the circle here between where we sit in 2024 and, and this happening and, and that flex coming? It's. I mean, it's a very difficult position to be in, particularly yeah. if you are trying to model the future of energy, that, yeah. that we are in this slightly paradoxical situation that emissions will reach the highest level ever mm -hmm. in 2023. Oil demand will be at an all-time high. Mm -hmm. Coal likely as well. But it's because of those changes that we're seeing in clean energy technologies, particularly solar, wind, and electric vehicles. They are moving really very quickly. Yeah. Just two years ago, one in 25 cars that were sold was electric. This year, it's one in five. And by the time we get to 2030, we would expect globally for every car so called sold that is an internal combustion engine car, one will be sold that's electric. I mean, that's a huge change in a very, very short yeah, period absolutely. of time. So it's those clean energy technologies are really keeping the window open. Yes, we are reaching a, a, a high level of emissions, the highest ever level of emissions, but that pace of change in clean energy is really means that we're at an inflection point today. And again, I don't think people fully appreciate that. Yeah. That's great to hear. So, Christoph, thank you so much. To, uh, maybe Justin had, had, had a build on that, please. Yep. Yeah. No, of course. Let's make this just to dialogue. Keep the discussion yeah. li just to keep the discussion lively, right? I fully, fully agree with you, Christoph. I mean, I, I, I sort of have you know, that background as well, and I know that inflection point. But I was at, a, at a, a session earlier today, which was, I think, somebody from Imperial College was presenting this uh, presentation. Um, and, you know, we saw the cost of capital for financing wind and solar projects fall dramatically. The LCOEs are, are way below fossil fuels in majority of countries. But it seems like, and I think what we're trying to talk about is not so much China or even sub-Saharan Africa. We're looking at Southeast Asia, right? Th these are countries that are somewhere in the middle in the sense that they attract investment, yet they still have a lot of the issues of emerging market uh, challenges for investment. So cost of capital for a wind project in Southeast Asia is, you know, 9 to 12%, right? Plus maybe 200, 300 basis points above given interest rates are rising, right? And it's not hydrogen either. Hydrogen is not commercially viable. We're talking about solar and wind, which supposedly are. So I don't know, actually. I wonder, what, I wonder how do we get past that? And that's maybe not a technology issue. It's something to do with something else. <laughs> yeah. Agreed. Thank you, Stuff. Yeah. So I'm conscious we have, uh, we have a, oh, I'm sorry. Tony, please, of course, of course, yeah. It's okay. Yeah. I just want to actually um, see, maybe tell a story about what's happening in China. I think it's already reported, but actually, if you only, when you go to China, you will realize actually how much difference is happening. So Chris was talking about actually one in, one in 10 or two in 10 or two in five to, to the most. But in China, actually, the average sales of new cars, uh, four out of 10 is EVs now. And by end of next year, probably five. So half of them new sale ca sold cars are EVs. Um, in some provinces, for example, in Shanghai, in uh, some cities in Shanghai, in Shenzhen, the ratio might be already as high as 70 or even, seven, uh, even higher than 70%. So that's a lot of change. And that change leads to a lot of things. The sales of gasoline is actually, are, are, um, I think, are dropping um, very steadily. Um, from a uh, historical peak uh, a few years ago. Um, <clears throat> and that also reduce, uh, increased the, uh, the consumption of electricity. While in the meantime, China is constructing the world's largest fleet of solar panels and wind turbines, and there are now farms in China. So <clears throat> that will reach the technology limit. How much energy can you transmit from one place to another? While the demand actually is mostly in, in eastern China or northern China. While the most of the resources are located in western China. So what you can do about it, you transmit or you just allocate the uh, uh, local consumption. Um, <clears throat> so that's one challenge. And the other challenge is, um, I was speaking with one expert on energy and also green finance, of course, just uh, two weeks or three weeks ago. And uh, very soon we realized, 20 years ago, China started uh, um, encouraging the development of EVs, starting the development or deployment of solar and wind 
um, energy. And uh, now we see more like uh, um, <clears throat> the payoffs coming back very quickly. And uh, <clears throat> in the very beginning, I think government was providing some subsidies. Just like I said, um, the ARA um, Act in the, uh, in the United States. In China, the government's also provided some subsidies to the green um, early R&D and also early stage development and the deployment. Yes, it scaled up very quickly. And uh, now I think it's market-based. Nobody, no, nobody needs to be scaled or needs to be incentivized to buy a EV. I was doing a lot of uh, polls on, in classes or in uh, training sessions asking them, if you want to buy a new car or a second car, uh, which one would you choose, the conventional one or EVs? 90% of them. The younger generation you, you ask, I think the ratio will be higher for EVs. Mm. That's more a market-driven process. And uh, the market, um, I think, competitiveness for the EVs is growing. And the same thing is happening in the energy market. So for a company to invest in, let's say, EV, for example, solar or wind, or invest in, in coal, they probably don't hesitate to invest in EV or solar. Um, uh, sorry, solar or wind. Because the operating cost is really, really low, close to zero, incremental. And uh, <clears throat> they know that in the future, the coal um, will be, the, the price will be even higher, and uh, also the uh, carbon uh, either tax or a carbon emission trading system, the carbon price will be growing. So with that in mind, now the government actually has also come to an ex extreme in China's huge market. China is producing, I think, uh, about one-fourth of the world electricity. And that electricity is not easy to store. And uh, wind and solar are not actually as stable as, as coal or any other forms of fossil fuel. So what you can do about it? Now the coal projects, any new build pr coal projects, are more like used to um, accompany a new, uh, let's say the EV, uh, sorry, the, the solar or wind farms to stabilize the grid. So most of them are more like emerging uh, power plants. They are not used to, to operate in full capacity. And now they do not want to do that. So the government has to say, I can compensate you how much uh, the emergency energy capacity you can provide to stabilize the, uh, the grid. I can compensate on that, not on the power you provided to the electricity. So that's a very quick switch, um, let's say switch, between the direction of travel for the potential, uh, now it's a very minimum, subsidy from the government to electricity. That means it's a quite different story already in China to other countries. To other countries, probably government needs to still inv uh, incentivize the, 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 the new, uh, let's say, um, uh, the, the uh, solar or wind or other types of renewable energy. But in China, if we, we can reduce the energy storage um, by either using a battery or other forms of like, storage, I think that will be much easier. Otherwise, in the short term, I guess they would still encourage some kind of um, <clears throat> energy storage uh, facility to stabilize the grid. And while you're constructing uh, tons or maybe gigawatts um, um, of, of renewable energies. So that's a very different story from what I see in China, probably with some uh, other countries, including Southeast Asia, maybe in, uh, in, in Africa as well. Yeah. That's great. No, no, I'm okay. Well, I mean, I, I do, th we're, sort of, we're sort of out of time. So, so maybe, but I, but maybe just to kind of, I think, tie a few things sort of together and, and maybe leave us with a challenge rather than an answer. Um, you know, I think it's quite interesting that, you know, we've, even though we talked about sort of differences, we see, you know, different sort of countries kind of across the region and even some sort of outside that have different sort of escape velocity. But, you know, by and large, I th the trajectory is, is all moving in one direction, right? A lot of interest in sort of demand, you know, moving along. Uh, a lot of sort of projects there and known technologies. Um, yet, again and again, I think we come back to the problem of the capital and how do we sort of unlock the capital given the constraints on... To, the, the cost of capital and sort of other issues. Um, and, and while I, I don't think we'll, we'll solve it in the last sort of minute here, uh, I think it really speaks to, you know, where I think attention with, you know, GFANS and uh, AIB and sort of others needs to go to try to figure out, you know, how do we crack that problem? Uh, because many of the pieces and building blocks are in place, uh, but now it's really a question of how do we pay for it and who's going to pay. Yeah. So with that, let me say a very warm thank you to our panel. Appreciate you, you making sort of time late in the day here. Um, and, and thank you all for, for attending and joining this afternoon. Thanks.